I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com and here today with me is Adam Rosenzweig, Managing Partner at Gary and Rosenzweig. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you as usual. Great to speak with you as well. It's been a little while. It's been a little while and we're going to go into what I think is a really interesting topic today. We've gone over various areas in the past, but this one is one that we haven't touched on before and that's EVs. So EVs kind of take the spotlight in your latest market commentary. And really EVs, I think they've become kind of a, a given in the energy transition, but you present some, some interesting ideas suggesting that they're actually going to fail in a couple of different ways. They are not as energy efficient as internal combustion engine vehicles. And they're also perhaps not as good as we thought at reducing carbon emissions. So interesting, interesting topics to go into there. And where I thought we could begin is maybe by looking at that energy efficiency claim that you've made there. Sure, sure thing. And, you know, we, we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours on this one topic. So I'll try to keep uh, my my comments brief and to the point. And um, it's, it's a really deep and, and interesting and fruitful topic. And I would highly recommend if people, you know, want to read more, they can go and visit our website where we have our full commentary uh, where, where we go into quite a bit more depth. And, and I should point out, you know, our interest in the EVs, but we're natural resource investors. And so we do have quite a bit of oil and gas exposure, but our mandate allows us to go in any different direction and we can own battery metals and um, we can own uh, all, all different um, areas and, and subsectors within the natural resource market. So several years ago, when EVs started to get a leg of steam and you know, driven primarily by the early adoption of, of Teslas around the world, uh, we had a really interesting um, debate and a really interesting question that we had to answer for ourselves. And that was, will the electric vehicle ultimately succeed in displacing the internal combustion engine? And there were some reasons to think, you know, that it might, you know, costs were coming down and because of scale and things like that, there was hope that costs would continue to fall quite dramatically. And so we needed to figure out a framework because if in fact, EVs were going to be, um, you know, very competitive with internal combustion engines, then we would have to really consider changing our outlook for oil demand and gasoline demand and diesel demand. And the framework that we took, and, and you can debate us on this or, or not, but has to do with this concept of energy efficiency. And the idea that if you go back and look over hundreds of years, really even over thousands of years, all of human history has been a steady progress towards more and more efficient uses of energy. And so you can go back and look at you know, widespread adoption of the early steam engines, uh, which were horribly inefficient when they began. And then as things got more and more efficient, we saw mass proliferation of the steam engine to replace things like the water wheel and things of that nature. And you know, in more recent times, you can look at the mass adoption of air travel over ocean liners, which is dramatically more efficient. And in that case, what the way we're going to define efficiency is how much energy gets consumed per passenger mile traveled. And so when you look at that, you know, it, it is recently as, you know, 1950, the vast majority of transatlantic travel was all taking place by ocean liner. And Boeing introduced the original 707 jet. Uh, it reduced that efficient or increased that efficiency, reduced the energy intensity per passenger mile traveled by a dramatic margin. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but about 50 or 60%. And, and we saw a huge, huge, huge switch very, very quickly between ocean line transport and then eventually into into jet travel. And, you know, that I think also addresses this other common refrain that we hear all the time, which is that energy transitions take a long time. And, and actually, if you look over history, we don't think that that's the case at all. You know, the huge adoption of the steam engine or the jet travel really points towards the suggestion that if you have very efficient means uh, of energy harnessing, then you're going to see widespread adoption very, very quickly. And so um, that became the framework and frankly, the obsession with which we looked at the electric vehicle. So the question is, is the electric vehicle more efficient than the internal combustion engine? And here again, I think it's really important to try to frame it with what are we actually talking about? Because I'll, I'll talk about some of the misconceptions. So what we're talking about is the amount of energy as measured in kilowatt hours to move someone 100 miles in uh, a car, either an internal combustion engine car or in a uh, electric vehicle. 
And one of the things that we heard over and over and over again was that the EV is hugely efficient. It's somewhere like 90% efficient. And those numbers are really debatable, but let's go with 90% efficient. And what people are really talking about there is the electrons, once they're in the battery of the car, 90% of that energy gets translated into the wheels to move that car forward, compared with an internal combustion engine that at the very, very best is somewhere in the range of 30% efficient, right? With the rest of that energy being dissipated in the form of heat. You know, you touch the, the hood of your car, you see how much heat is being generated. And quite frankly, even most of the heat is coming out the exhaust pipe at the end. That's all just wasted energy. And only, you know, 30% of the uh, energy as measured in kilowatt hours or megajoules stored in the gasoline is making its way through the transmission and ultimately to the wheel. So on that metric, you'd say, yeah, the EV is going to have a huge ability to displace the internal combustion engine. But it's a really faulty analysis. And the reason it's so faulty is the idea of how on earth do you get those electrons into the car and how, more importantly, do you keep them in the car? And that, of course, deals with the battery and it deals with the idea of <clears throat> how much energy is required to mine all the materials, process all the materials, both the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel, the copper, uh, and then to assemble and manufacture the battery, which is also incredibly energy intensive. People don't realize, but, you know, and I'm going to really probably upset the the chemists and engineers out there. But but what you're ultimately doing is you're creating a solution with all these different chemicals in it, and then you're drying that solution out to turn it from you know uh, an aqueous solution into a into a paste into the jelly rolls and the battery forms that we know. And there's really only one way to remove the liquid from a you know solution into a paste, and that's through creating a lot of heat. And so the energy that's required in the manufacturing is also a tremendous amount as well. And conveniently, most people just completely disregard that huge amount of energy that goes into actually assembling and manufacturing and mining the materials that go into the electric vehicle, notably the battery. And so that, that was the kind of the first place that we started. And we said, well, how can we begin to try to quantify that? And so we added up all the energy that was needed to make those materials. We divided it by the useful life of the battery, which is another big debate. But you know, we think that we got into a, a fairly good range at about 150,000 miles uh, on the battery pack. and and Notably, Tesla only guarantees their batteries to about 80,000 miles. So I think that's probably a good indication of where they think that battery, that lithium ion battery begins to peter out. And what we noticed was that the total energy consumed in an electric vehicle, about half of that was being consumed with the actual electricity going into the car, and half of it was embedded in the battery itself. And that was just a number that no one felt comfortable including in their total tally of how much energy gets consumed. And, and that's just so different from an internal combustion engine, right? In an internal combustion engine, 90% of the total energy in the life of that vehicle comes in the form of the gasoline that goes in the car. With an EV, about half of it comes from actually making the battery itself. And so right off the bat, we, we felt that people were not making that proper comparison, and we had to make that adjustment. The next thing that became really, really clear to us was what matters ultimately is what the source of the electricity is, right? Because that in and of itself is going to require a lot of materials. We've talked a lot in the past about the, the shortfalls and shortcomings of wind and solar and how much steel and concrete and cement go into making those huge pieces of infrastructure compared to, let's say, you know, a natural gas turbine, which is actually quite efficient. And what we were realizing there is that, again, people weren't properly capturing the huge upstream energetic um, or efficiencies of going towards a wind, solar, EV ecosystem. When you put it all together, there was really very little doubt in our mind that the total energy, I'm talking cradle to grave, of an electric vehicle was far greater than an internal combustion engine. And I think that's ultimately why we're starting to see these EVs begin to pile up on lots. That's why we're ultimately beginning to see subsidies or continuing to see subsidies be necessary in order to incentivize people to switch from EV and, and things of that nature. And so that became a really, really important thrust in our research and in our investing process and ultimately in the companies that we chose in the sectors that we chose to put our clients' capital to work at. And, and that's something that I think is playing out every day. Okay. Really, really good explanation there. It helps me understand very well what you're thinking. And I do recommend though that people people actually read the report. We can link to it in the video description in case they want to learn more. 
So that's the energy efficiency side. And then we also have the carbon emissions side. So I'm hoping you can go into that as well, where EVs are not bringing us the reduction in carbon emissions that we might have hoped for. I know in the report you have an interesting case study where you talk about Norway because that's a country where there has been a lot of uptake of EVs, although, of course, you mentioned how that's all related to subsidies and things like that. So maybe we can take a look at that carbon emissions side. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there, there, there are two sides of the same coin in, in a lot of ways, but in some ways they're, they're also a little bit different. So we have to make, I think, one key distinction here. We can talk about the potential for an EV to reduce CO2 emissions by simply saying, OK, how much CO2 does a internal combustion engine generate, assuming we drive it 20,000 miles a year, 15, 20,000 miles a year, um, versus if you ran that same electric vehicle on um, a clean source of power. In Norway's case, it's it's hydropower. They have, I think, 90, 80 something, 90% of their electricity gets generated by hydropower. And, what, and so you can make those calculations and very clearly, you know, even with the additional energy that's needed to um, manufacture the electric vehicle battery and things like that, what you quickly see is that, yeah, you know, in theory, on paper, an electric vehicle does manage to reduce CO2. If, if every electric vehicle that gets rolled out onto the highways displaces uh, an internal combustion engine uh, one for one. But what we noticed with Norway, switching to a real world example, is that's far from the case. So what we saw in Norway was that over the last 15 years or so, EV penetration has gotten up to the 80% of new car sales. And so you're now talking about having displaced 25, 20, 25% of the entire Norwegian automotive fleet. So these are big numbers. There's nowhere that's really managed to have such a high inroad uh, or penetration for new electric vehicles as in uh, Norway. And, and also what's kind of interesting about that is that all of the electricity that powers that or the, the vast preponderance comes from hydro, which, you know, we talk about EROI and clean energy and hydrocarbons. Hydro is great. If you have hydro, you should be using hydro. That's really energy efficient. Uh, it has the highest EROI or energy return on investment of any source of energy in the world, basically, except for nuclear. Um, and it's completely clean. Obviously, some environmentalists get upset about damming and, and destruction to watersheds and things of that nature. But as far as CO2, there's absolutely no CO2 that gets emitted in the life of that um, project or very minimal for the concrete and cement needed for the dams. So Norway should be a wonderful utopian example of how CO2 levels plummeted. But in fact, what we saw is that CO2 in Norway only decreased by about 10 to 15%. Now, at, at first blush, you might say, okay, 10 to 15%, that sounds great. You you went up to 80% penetration in your EV sales of new cars. You displaced about 20% of the fleet. And so you got 15% CO2 savings. By that logic, if we continue to go down that path, then we'll actually start to see um, you know, if we get to 100% EVs, maybe we could reduce it 100%. But, you know, the devil's in the details. And what Norway has been very, very good at doing over the last 10 or 15 years is switching out a tremendous amount of fuel oil and residual fuel used mainly for heating and some power as well, uh, away from hydrocarbons towards electric and towards um, mostly from hydro. So that actually explains two thirds or three quarters, something, you know, a huge number uh, of the reduction in CO2 in Norway over the last 15 years. And if actually you look at gasoline and oil demand, that hasn't budged at all. You know, I think it's down something like, you, and again, don't hold me to these numbers, it's down 3,000 barrels you know, a day over the last 15 years. And and when we first ran those numbers, we said, well, we must be off. It must be like 3 million or something like that. You know, when no, it, and first of all, Norway is a small country, so it doesn't have a large population, but it's actually 3,000 barrels. Uh, of oil a day has been saved in passenger transportation in the last 15 years or so. Now, on the other hand, right, you've had to put 500,000 EVs on the road in Norway, and that's created a huge amount of CO2 because of all the energy that goes in to making the battery like I, like I talked about in, in, before. And still today, you know, most EVs and most EV batteries are manufactured in China, where a lot of that power, the, mo the majority of that power, comes from coal, which is actually quite dirty. So when you start to look at how much CO2 was actually released in building 500,000 vehicles every year, in total, and you compare that 
to the amount of annual savings of having reduced your gasoline and oil demand for transportation by 3,000 barrels, and you realize that that will pay for itself in CO2 terms in about 45 years. Now, of course, the batteries won't last 45 years, so you have a huge net negative. You know, you've know, you released more life cycle CO2 by moving 500,000 EVs uh, or by adding 500,000 EVs in Norway uh, and reducing your oil demand by 3,000 barrels a day. And what we're starting to see, and this is really more a question of consumer behavior than it is a question of you know straight physics, is that when people buy EVs, particularly in wealthy countries, and particularly when they are massively subsidized by the government, such as they are in Norway, both in the form of tax credits, in the form of waived um, sales tax, in the form of waived import duties, and in uh, ancillary benefits, including free charging, free parking, and free use of bus lanes and ferries and things like that, what you see is that people add an EV to their fleet. They don't necessarily replace the internal combustion engine with an electric vehicle, but rather instead, they add a second car. And you can see that in, in Norway, and you can see it very clearly by looking at the number of cars per household for internal combustion vehicles, which is like 0.7, you know, for if you just look at all the the the, the um, internal combustion vehicles families out there, basically one, call it. And then you look at the number of cars per average family where they have an EV. And I think 65 or 70 percent of those households have two cars. So they've added a second car. And that second car that they have added is an electric vehicle. Now, again, the reason that this is so important is that if you look at an internal combustion engine, all of the CO2 gets generated out of the tailpipe. And so if you add a second car, but you only drive each of your cars 50% of the time, there's not going to be much in the way of net increase in CO2. But if you add an EV as your second car, where you've spent all the CO2 up front in the form of manufacturing the battery, and then all of a sudden what you do is just drive it you know, 25% of the time and short commutes and things like that, you've spent all that CO2 and you're not getting any of the incremental savings over time. And that's the big difference. And so that's why the net effect, and people talk about Norway as this wonderful case study uh, of how EVs are positive, but it's because they don't have to include any of the carbon that gets released in China um, and other dirty countries that burn coal to manufacture the materials that go into these things. They're only counting what comes out of the tailpipe. So when you looked at that, it's really quite shocking. And what it told us was that, yes, you know, if we're going to go down this path, um, the fact that they are less energy efficient, I think, really speaks to why they need subsidies in order to coerce, for lack of a better word, consumers into uh, purchasing them. You know, no one had to subsidize jet travel to get people off the ocean liners. Uh, but then also the fact that the uh, ongoing... Uh, energy efficiency is so poor is that is that people will still have this preference towards their internal combustion engine and they'll simply add on an EV with all of this upfront uh, cost of carbon that goes along with it. And and to us, that's just a really bullish way of going about things. This is, this is very eye-opening when you lay it all out like that. So thanks for taking the time to go through it. I promise we're, we're going to get down to the commodity level later on in the conversation. But for now, I want to ask you, given all that you've said, what do you see as the future of EV penetration? I know in the report how you talk about maybe a battery breakthrough could be something that pushes it in the right direction. So maybe we could hear a little bit about that. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, our view of, of needing a battery breakthrough it comes as much from necessity as it does from, you know, optimism, let's say. When you look at the flow sheet of the electric vehicle, absent a battery breakthrough, there's just really no hope. You know, th th there's not a lot of room for improvement on the electric motor, as we discussed before. The electric motor is actually quite efficient. You know, that that's not where you lose it. Where you lose it's in the battery. And so when you just kind of, you know, it, it's, I suppose, like looking at a home renovation, you say, well, we're going to cut costs. Well, you know, you look at the roof or whatever. It's like, there's only a few huge line items that you could conceivably try to get costs down. So absent of battery breakthrough, I don't think that there's really much hope for, for large scale EV penetrations. Absent huge government subsidies or eventual ICE ban, stuff that everyone's talking about. But the question is, how much will the consumer ultimately be willing to accept going down that path. And even in Norway, there's huge cracks in the foundation now. And what the way they're coming is 
the idea that EV subsidies now take up more Norwegian spending than all of their infrastructure on the roads and ferries and bridges and things like that. And so there's been a big backlash throughout Norway, particularly from people outside of the major cities that say, well, hey, wait a second, this is totally elitist. And this is incredibly, incredibly regressive because all of the you know cosmopolitan people living in the big cities uh, are, are availing themselves of free charging and of free parking and of free ferry terminal service and stuff like that by getting these EVs. But people out in the countryside that need range and, and don't have as much money to buy the more expensive electric vehicles are left with crumbling infrastructure because the money is being routed to you know these wealthy elites. Now I'm I'm editorializing a little bit, but that but that's a lot of the sentiment that's taking place through Norway uh, as as we speak, and there's been big pushback there. So you know, like my partner Lee likes to say, well you know this will go who this can continue longer than we think because the governments can be more foolish. But you know eventually uh, the consumer I think wins out. Eventually you know the 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 um, you know freedom of choice takes takes over and and I think that um, the idea that the governments know best and that the governments can legislate this into existence uh, will, will probably force them to come apart at the seams and, and we've seen examples of that over over time so you know where, where does that leave uh, EV penetration ultimately it's really anyone's guess because it, you know how foolish can governments get and they can probably go quite quite a ways uh, do we see a battery breakthrough on the horizon I don't think anything that has um, made us willing to change our view on, you know, certainly medium uh, term oil demand. Uh, there is a few things, there are a few things and a few technologies that I think hold promise. You know, everyone talks about the idea of solid state batteries. And the idea there uh, is that by moving away um, from the current lithium ion technology to a straight uh, solid state or lithium metal uh, type of a framework, you could really increase energy density. The problem, of course, is maybe not of course, but the problem has so far been in the manufacturing of those batteries. And there's not really a clear indication that that's been overcome. We're actually invested in a private company in Boston that I think is probably at the forefront uh, of a quasi solid state lithium metal battery. It's called Pure Lithium. Uh, we're disclosed as an investor there. So I'm, I'm happy to um, to talk about that. Uh, the technical team there is is unbelievable and excellent. And what they're working on uh, is I think very, very revolutionary, but it's very, very early. And, and I don't think that it poses a, a near-term risk to energy so or to, to oil demand. So I think that you know if you can crack that nut, um, then in theory, the efficiency of the electric motor can begin to do its thing. The problem though is in what you have to spend in the battery. And you know I, I would recommend there's a couple really good books on the battery industry and what should be kind of a dull, boring, dumb, you know, Energizer Bunny and Duracell type of an industry is actually, you know, filled with characters and charlatans and double crosses and backroom deals and all kinds of fun stuff. So it's great for anyone who likes to read financial history, uh, but it's a tough industry. And, you know, I've seen really good companies fall by the wayside. I've seen really, really bad companies um, promote a lot of nonsense. And so I would be, you know, very skeptical before counting on a new battery breakthrough anytime soon. Okay. And, you know, you've mentioned the, the upfront carbon costs associated with the batteries, with electric vehicles. So I'm wondering what you think. I've, I've started to see a little bit more often uh, battery metals companies starting to talk about zero carbon mining operations. I don't know if any of them have actually managed to do this, but it seems to be a concept that they are, are toying with at the moment. So do you think that helps at all? What are your thoughts? Well, I think you end up in a really bad feedback loop there because what ends up happening is, you know, again, if, if you look at the energy efficiency of oil and gas, and so you drill a single oil well and the amount of energy that you get back at the wellhead for the amount of energy that goes into the ground is is pretty astounding. It's it's very, very high. And then, of course, you lose a whole bunch of that in transportation and refining and taking the oil down to um, gasoline and diesel. But by the time it hits the consumer, it's still really, really high. And you know, for the initial unit of energy you put in, you're probably getting 30 units out, something like that, out the other side in the form of your gas tank. Then that gets converted in miles per gallon and stuff like that. And the car can go forward a certain amount of distance, right? For every unit you put in, we can calculate how far that car is going to go. So if you start to then say, okay, fine, an electric vehicle, because of all the energy that's needed, let's leave the CO2 out for a second, just the energy that's needed 
to propel that. You know, you're good and efficient in the electric motor. You're terrible in the battery manufacturing. You, you better darn well have a really efficient source of upfront energy in which to consume all that energy in the battery manufacturing. And so if you start to say, okay, we're going to power the EV with wind and solar, which in and of itself is really inefficient, that's a problem. But then if you say, we're also going to consume all the energy that goes into the battery manufacturing and in the form of a really inefficient wind and solar, now you're just putting problems on top of problems. And so now the total amount of energy to move that person a mile down the road goes up even more. Right. So the more, you know, if you like the most energy efficient vehicle that you could possibly make um, would be with the battery powered by, you know, a coal fired plant somewhere in China, really cheap with no scrubbers and no, you know, attempted CO2 remediation uh, and electricity generated by hyper efficient CCGT combined cycle gas turbine natural gas plants. But, you know, you're not doing much on the carbon side. And still, that would be more energy intensive than a simple ICE with um, with a uh, uh, you, that uses gasoline. Um, now, all of a sudden, if you say, well, I don't want the coal and I don't want the gas and that natural gas to power those different sources of upstream power, which are not currently being really included in people's calculation because they kind of happen off stage to the left and not coming out of the tailpipe. Now, all of a sudden, your total energy efficiency drops even farther and you become even more out of the money. So unfortunately, you know, it's all a bit of a vicious cycle. And I will say one thing, you know, if we as a society and, and we've talked a lot about nuclear power and nuclear power is in a lot of ways the holy grail because it's hyper efficient, the most efficient energy that humanity has ever harnessed and it emits no CO2. So if we decided that we wanted to go to an entirely nuclear backed battery manufacturing uh, electric mine fleet powered by um, by nuclear energy, uh, and then and then powered all of the consumer residential electricity base through nuclear. You know, you would probably have a car that was as efficient as an ICE. You might even have one that's even more efficient. So if we we're willing to do that, then all bets are off. But I don't think that we are. Uh, I wish that we would. And if if we go down that path, then you know I'll I'll agree to um, conceivably lessen our oil and gas investments. Okay, I think that that's good to go into that. That again helps me understand. So I, I said we will go back to the commodity level, and I'm wondering what all of your thoughts here mean for battery metals like lithium, cobalt, graphite. You know, I've become very used to hearing that. You know, in the short term, maybe there may be difficulties there. I know lithium is in a tough period right now, but for the long term, because we have this electric vehicle transition green energy, the prospects look right for these battery metals. So so what are your thoughts broadly there? So I think that lithium people should just stay away. And and you know, your listeners and viewers, um, hopefully they they know me a little bit by now. Um, you know, we're not traders. And so could lithium stocks be a trade? Yeah, I, I have no idea. There's a lot of people that are smarter about how to trade a stock in the short term than I am. But in the medium and the long term, there's absolutely no shortage of lithium um, on planet Earth. And the only thing needed to bring on more lithium is capital. That's kind of true in all commodity areas, but it's even more true in the lithium space because there's not a huge supply shortage. So the question then becomes, well, do we have a, a dearth of capital or, or a lack of capital uh, for lithium projects? And the answer as of right now is certainly not. You know, There's been a ton of investment in the lithium space. There's a ton of money sloshing around. It seems like there's new lithium deposits and projects being put forward uh, every day. So I think, you know, if you look at copper, if you look at oil and gas, if you look at coal is probably the most severe example, uranium too. You know, you went through a 10 year bear market where capital got sucked out of that space because of the boom that happened in the early 2000s. So we had overinvestment then, you had to work that off. You know, you're nowhere through that cycle in, in lithium. In fact, you know, you're, you're, you're still seeing new projects be sanctioned left, right, and center. So I think there has to be a ton of pain, even if demand is really strong. Demand, demand, honestly, when there's big investment booms, demand is never really enough uh, to overcome it. Just look at iron ore. Um, you know, 15 years ago, you, you, you built China and, and urbanized a billion people, but because of so much money that you put into Western Australia, that was enough to overcome it. And I think lithium is gonna be a similar story as far as some of the other metals go, you know, there's you really have to go kind of commodity by commodity, and and cobalt, you know, is an interesting one because cobalt there is quite a shortage. You know, there's not a lot of 
primary cobalt deposits in the world. There's Tenke Fugurami in the Congo, and that's really kind of honestly almost it. Everything else that come, comes as a byproduct. Um, and so, you know, if I had to bet on battery metals, um, I would probably prefer cobalt over lithium because uh, while there's been, you know, a, a huge demand for battery metals, investment demand across the, the, the space, um, there's just more of a supply tightness in that market. Uh, it's harder to find um, than lithium, which is relatively abundant. Um, if you look at nickel, that's kind of an interesting one too, because nickel, particularly high grade nickel for batteries, using batteries, um, that that's relatively rare, uh, particularly since um, the problems began uh, with Russia invading Ukraine in 2022, and Norilsk is a huge nickel producer. Uh, the problem there, though, is is twofold. One, on the supply side, you know, Indonesia is doing the unthinkable. They're cutting down huge swaths of their rainforest and mangroves to access really dirty nickel. You know, there, there's high-grade battery nickel and there's nickel laterites, and the nickel laterites require huge amounts of um, carbon-laden processing to bring that material into battery-grade technology doesn't make any sense at all. You know, you're literally, you know, the most efficient form of carbon sequestration are probably mangroves and rainforests, and you're cutting them down, releasing all that CO2 to then get at terribly dirty nickel deposits, which required then a ton of coal-fired CO2 power and heat uh, to process them into battery materials so that you could go and send them to Norway and replace three, a whopping 3,000 barrels a day of gasoline and oil demand and gasoline and diesel demand. So it doesn't make any sense, but they're doing it and there's a market for it, unfortunately. Um, so environmentally, it doesn't make any sense. Energetically, it doesn't make any sense, but it is a lot of new supply that's come online. On the demand side, then you have to remember that while batteries are growing, um, we would be cautious as to the rate of growth in a long-term basis because of everything we've talked about. And a lot of nickel still goes into the steel market. And so it, 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 you have to have an informed view on steel demand, uh, which a lot of people feel is probably, you know, at least if not peaking in the process of peaking, uh, certainly not as much growth going forward. So if, if all of a sudden, you know, you've been building out nickel supply to feed an ever-growing stainless steel market, which then begins to plateau, you know, will, will batteries be enough? I don't know. So every market's a little bit different. Uh, I, I, we, we stay away from all the battery metals because I don't really think that there's, you know, if there's a good high quality cobalt project somewhere, we might consider that. But out, outside of that, we, we try to stay away from them. Okay. I think that's a good overview of your thoughts. And you're right. Of course, all the metals do remain their own thing. So it's important to know about the other dynamics there as well. So you've, you've acknowledged, I think, that, you know, the claims that you've made about EVs are pretty controversial. So I'm curious, this report that we've been talking about, uh, we're talking about it just now. This is when we've had the chance to talk about it, but it's been out for a little while. So what response have you gotten there? And I'm curious as well, because I think I was excited to talk about this whole EV angle because I've had this in the back of my mind for a while We've gotten questions from our audience over the years about how green exactly are electric vehicles. So I think it, it might be something people have in the back of their mind, but it just hasn't come out uh, yet. Yeah, listen, uh, you know, we, 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 we put on our helmets and got ready, you know, for, for the onslaught and the tomatoes and everything like that. And honestly, we haven't really had too much pushback. In fact, we, we get a, always get a lot of people from the industry that reach out to us when we write our letters um, and and happy and thankful to say that uh, most often the comments that we do get from the industry and from people that are you know engineers and scientists are, are largely um, if not always uh, in, in agreement with us and the reason I say almost always is because quite frankly I, I could care less what Bay Street or Wall Street tells me but if the engineers that are working on these projects say, well no I think you missed something here then we'll, we'll hopefully change our tune pretty quickly so we're usually in sync with what's actually happening out in the world um, you know and then it's one of two things, you know, it's either that the people, um, you know, the, 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 the true believers in EVs and stuff like that just have no interest and don't read our stuff, which is entirely possible. You know, we're not, we're, we're not, um, Warren Buffett or anything like that, uh, or, or they just, you know, can't articulate a good response. Um, and I'm, I'm frankly not sure which, but we have not seen widespread pushback. Uh, I'm sure in some circles, people call us idiots and things like that. Uh, but largely, the reception has been uh, very, very positive and, and and mostly in in agreement. And, and quite frankly, you know, when you start to really dig in and you start to look at the numbers, um, it, it's all very clear that, that the discrepancy comes in how people begin to 
define the question. I know that's kind of a vague term, but I'll give you a really good example, okay? So an electric vehicle, as I said, takes 80 to 90% of the energy that's in the battery and puts it to the wheels. An internal combustion engine, 70% is lost to heat, so it's only 20 to 30% efficient. So we've seen a lot of people that say an, an electric vehicle is three times more energy efficient than an internal combustion engine. And, and like in some ways, I, I do understand what they're trying to say, that that's not incorrect. You do lose a lot of exhaust heat coming out of the tailpipe that doesn't get lost in the electric vehicle. However, uh, I think it, what becomes really important is to just frame it and say, well, what is it that you really want to know? And I think ultimately what people really want to know is if you have a unit of scarce energy and energy today is becoming scarcer and scarcer and scarcer, and you have one unit of scarce energy at the complete upstream of the whole process, how far can you move someone? You know, to me, that's the measure of efficiency. It's not whether or not in the vehicle itself, the the efficiency of a motor is different from an internal combustion engine. It's starting with a scarce resource. What can you get out of it? To me, that's the definition of efficiency. And when you put it in those terms, you can agree or disagree with me whether that's the right definition of efficiency, but it's hard to disagree with the physics if you do begin to look as far upstream as we do. And I think that's really what scientists and and Physicists call it the boundary condition, which I think just makes it unnecessarily complicated. That's what we're really trying to get at. You know, with the scarce resource, how can we maximize it? And I think that's what we should all be asking ourselves in every every um, use case that that we're looking at. Okay, and I'll, I'll try not to keep you too long. I have a couple more questions, and one is. You know, EVs are part of this larger shift toward clean energy that it seems like around the world, we have agreed that we've we've got to do this. And it sounds like in your opinion on the EV side, we've gotten it kind of wrong in a number of ways. So I'm almost afraid to ask, but are there other elements of this, this clean energy transition that are being gotten wrong? Well, again, I think I think wind and solar are just completely wrong. Yeah. You know, I think that the energy density in wind and solar are so low that to harness the same quantities of usable energy, you have to make it bigger. You know, I'm trying to make this really simple and stay away from the complicated, you know, theories or whatever. But if your energy density, which is to say the amount of energy per unit of volume is orders of magnitude lower and, and wind and solar clearly are, you know, put your hand outside on a hot day versus put it over your gas stove. I promise you the density is not the same. Um, then in order to harness the same quantity, it has to be a bigger size. And that's why... Um, you know, an oil well uh, takes up as much space as it does, a natural gas well as much space as it does, uh, and, and a windmill stands 30 stories high and you have to have, you know, a fleet of 20 of them to get the same energy that comes. It's just not the same density. And so if all of that stuff didn't require energy to build and didn't require CO2 uh, to construct, um, then it wouldn't matter, but it does. And so your total efficiency just drops and drops and drops. So I think wind and solar, I think we've beaten that to death over the years. I think that we're starting to see it really come through in some of the performance and some of the write-offs that these companies are not able to now go forward now that energy costs are higher and steel costs are higher and capital costs are higher. Um, but EVs are definitely another. But where I think people are also getting it wrong, and I'll be kind of optimistic on this, uh, is they are underestimating some of the other sources of potential CO2 mitigation and savings that we do have at our disposal. Um, and one of them, again, we're, we are invested in this as well, uh, is a company out of Boston called Boston Metal. And what they're doing is they're coming up with a technology, you know, or they have it, uh, and, they're, and they're rolling it out now, uh, to create steel uh, with no coal. Now, another company or another set of companies are looking to do this um, using hydrogen. Unfortunately, when you go through the total energy requirement of the hydrogen path, it's quite high, uh, or higher than Boston Metals for sure. And Boston Metals is using molten oxide electrolysis. It's using electricity and high temperatures in order to, you know, what you basically want to do when you're making steel is you take iron ore, which is iron oxide, iron and oxygen, and you need to separate the oxygen from the iron. And steel is then the pure iron mixed with some additives afterwards. And in order to split that apart, what we've done for thousands of years is that we've heated up iron oxide in the presence of coal, which is pure carbon. And what that does is it heats up the iron oxide, that bond breaks apart between the iron and the oxygen, and the oxygen is sequestered with the carbon. Now, the downside is that when you put oxygen and carbon together, what do you get? You get CO2. And so CO2 is a natural byproduct of making steel using coal. 
You could also reduce iron oxide with hydrogen. Uh, it's more complicated and costly. Or you can try to do it with electrons, and that's what Boston Metal's trying to do. But what people don't fully appreciate, and you know, I'll, we'll, I'll leave the debate aside as to whether hydrogen or electricity is the way to go. We obviously think it's electricity. But what people fail to appreciate um, is that global CO2 from steelmaking is about 9%. And that's not far from what the entire passenger commercial automotive fleet globally is. So if you looked at Tesla and you looked at BYD and you looked at, you know, Rivian and you looked at every single company, which is now, you know, at the best in, in Norway, getting to 15% total fleet penetration, if you could snap your fingers and replace every car in the world tomorrow, right, with all of the charging infrastructure that requires, leaving aside the fact that you can't have enough cobalt, that you don't have enough, you know, at that point, if you were to do everything, probably even then lithium might even be a buy. Um, you, you you would only be at the same level as steel if you could get this one process right. And so you could see mass proliferation of new steel making technologies, we think using electricity, uh, which could have huge impacts on a global global basis. So I think that's really good. The other one that I think is, is really interesting, which, you know, it, people will probably roll their eyes. I don't know why, but everyone wants like a whiz bang kind of new fancy answer. Uh, I think reforestation uh, is, is a huge, simple, easy, cheap way uh, to mitigate CO2 or to capture more CO2 and sequester it in the root structures of the of the trees and plants. And we seem to be going the opposite direction. You know, it's like we're burning wood chips and wood pellets and somehow, you know, cutting down old growth forest and in, in the Carolinas and shipping it to Germany gets you a green credit, um, cutting down mangroves and, and rainforests in Indonesia to get nickel to make EVs gets you a green credit. Uh, but but those are the things that really work. They're they're not intrusive. They're extremely cheap, um, and they do a really good job. So I think that that's kind of the way. Um, you know, if we could if we could get rid of steel making, we could improve cement making, and that's a really tricky one. If we could move towards nuclear, or even just move away from coal towards natural gas, we could go a long way at addressing our CO two issues while maintaining or even improving um, our energy efficiency. And that's before we, we bring in nuclear, which, which solves really all of the world's problems, I hate to say. Okay, I, I will let you go in just a moment. This was a really good overview of what's going on. And I think throughout this interview, you've given a lot of ideas on what investors should or should not do, things they should consider. But as we tie it up, any any final thoughts you would leave investors with on how to approach this? Because it is it's pretty complicated. You know, I, I think that the, the one thing that I would leave everybody with is that for several years, we have existed in this era of really cheap energy and really cheap capital, and that's distorted a lot of things. And for the last, you know, six, seven years since we first talk, started talking about this, a lot of these debates were academic. You know, you did them on the back of a napkin and you tallied up all the energy, but just like a household that has a huge amount of savings doesn't really matter wh where you invest or how you spend it. You know, it only matters when you start running out of money uh, in the same way. And that's not financial advice. That's just kind of a, an anecdotal piece of advice. Investing in matters no matter how much money you have. But, um, you know, it, this in the same way, when we had cheap, abundant energy and cheap, abundant capital, we could make mistakes and it didn't really come to the surface. And so we went down these huge paths. And, you know, I want to avoid the cliche, but we went chasing windmills, it, it, literally. And... Um, that's now changing. You know, we, we now have a, a much more precarious energy situation on a global basis. Uh, we have a much more precarious situation, certainly in Europe. North America has been blessed with pretty abundant natural resources, um, but we've underinvested for too long and is starting to come to the fore. And so now these questions have gone from being academic to actually being quite important, almost you know overnight it seems like. And so you're seeing political unrest in countries. Uh, where new political parties are coming up opposing these types of things. You're starting to see uh, the deindustrialization of Germany that's gone down this huge path towards uh, wind, solar, and electric vehicles. Um, you're starting to see countries that have really pushed a nuclear strategy do much better. You know, if you look at France versus looking at Germany, for instance. Uh, and so I think that it's really starting to have ramifications and it really can't be ignored anymore. So I think we've had a couple of years to brush up and read the different books and get smart on the topic. But now is where the um, you know rubber meets the road, so to speak. And I think that it's going to have a huge impact in the next five to 10 years. 
Okay. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for coming on today to take the time to go through all these things to do with electric vehicles. It was very valuable, I think, for me and, and for the audience. Well, thank you so much. I always like our conversations. I hope to see you again soon. Of course. Hope to do it again soon. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is Adam Rosenzweig with Gehring and Rosenzweig. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.